Good afternoon, and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm Brian Edwards Teekert, morning host on the world's first listener-supported radio station, KPFA. One of the great pleasures of my work is getting to read brilliant books about the world we live in, and then talk to the people who wrote them. It gives me joy to share that pleasure with you today in the virtual Commonwealth Club, whose programs reside at www.commonwealthclub.org. Our guest is cultural historian Rick Perlstein. He's devoted four sweeping books to chronicling the rise of the modern American right. The first, Before the Storm, covers Barry Goldwater, the insurgent Republican presidential candidate whose campaign galvanized a generation of movement conservatives. His second, Nixonland, it covers the president who looked like he would be the end of the Republican Party. His third, The Invisible Bridge, chronicles how America went from the impeachment of Nixon to the election of one of the only politicians who had supported him all the way through the Watergate scandal. That person was a former celebrity whose campaign slogans when he ran for president was make America great again. The person I'm describing, of course, is Ronald Reagan. And Rick's latest book chronicles how his campaigns for office remade the Republican Party and the country. It's entitled Reaganland, America's Right Turn, 1976 to 1980. Rick Perlstein from my home studio in Berkeley to yours in Chicago. Welcome to the Virtual Commonwealth Club. Hi, Brian. Uh, great to be here. I'm very grateful to the Commonwealth Club. One of my greatest joys is meeting and discussing my work with my readers. So I look forward to this afternoon. Uh, I will give those readers in our live audience a, a quick note on participation before we jump in. Uh, if you all have questions for Rick, please post them through the YouTube chat feature. They'll get forwarded to me, uh, and I will do my best to bring your questions into the conversation as they arrive. So Rick, when you hear Republicans praise Ronald Reagan today, they usually focus on the things that he did as president, Cold War diplomacy, tax cuts, welfare cuts, deregulation. Uh, you have just devoted 1,100 pages, not to his presidency, but to the campaigns that got him there. Why, why constrain yourself to that period? Well, uh, I, when, I, when I conceived of this series, uh, I imagined it as a, a, book of, a, a series of three books became four that covered the years from 1958 to 1980. And 1980 is the logical terminus point for me for two reasons. First of all, I think that that's where pretty much the frames and logics and political ideologies that uh, define modern conservatism were pretty much well in place. The other reason is in 1980, I uh, turned 11 years old and we get into my life and it doesn't uh, really seem like history to me. Uh, it seems like uh, my own experiences. So I wouldn't have had the critical distance, I think, to tell a useful story about those years, unless you, know, you want to hear about my you know, bar mitzvah and getting my driver's license and you know, going to college. But it just seemed like a, a logical place to stop before moving on to something else. So you opened the book uh, in the 1976 election. This is Gerald Ford who has vanquished Ronald Reagan in the primary running against Jimmy Carter. Um, and, and the picture you paint of Reagan at this point is someone who is devoting his energy, not particularly to supporting his party's nominee, but to kind of taking the party over from within. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm curious, like for Reagan, do you think that's a product of, of ideology or just ambition? I think, think that it's a little of both, although Ronald Reagan was very cagey, probably to himself as well, about the question of ambition. When people were begging him to run for president going into 1976, he would say, well, the man doesn't choose the office. The, the office chooses the man. He'd tell all kinds of stories about how he only decided to run you know, after a woman begged him to on an airplane. Uh, the, the biggest wellspring of Ronald Reagan's psychological core was uh, his own sense of his own innocence, that he wasn't a person of ambition, uh, that he was a person who uh, was just doing what he was doing out of a sense of duty. Uh, he was a guy whose psyche, you know, was full of kind of um, curly cues and denial, and he never kind of thought, of, thought about things straight away. I think you can kind of chalk that up to a very chaotic childhood as an, 
child of an alcoholic in which uh, basically coming up with a narrative of himself as a rescuer, as a hero was very central to the core of his being. So he, he, he really couldn't be Ronald Reagan and think of himself as someone who was trying to seize power for himself, right? Uh, but at the same time, his ambition could be pretty naked uh, in ways that he, perhaps he didn't even quite fully understand. The book starts, the first sentence is, Ronald Reagan insisted that it wasn't his fault. And what that refers to was the widespread pundit conclusion that Gerald Ford lost because Ronald Reagan refused to actively campaign for him. And for example, if, if, if Gerald Ford had, had won Mississippi and had won Texas, he would have had enough electoral votes to beat Jimmy Carter. Those are, of course, both states in which Ronald Reagan had enormous popularity, uh, but he adamantly turned down invitations to campaign for the ticket. And it was very hard for pundits to conclude that he wasn't hoping for Gerald Ford to lose and that he would have a clear shot in 1980. So that's pretty ambitious, right? Um, but it's also uh, something that he certainly never could admit to himself. Uh, he uh, was a very mysterious guy when it came to his psyche. Sometimes his wife would say that she didn't even understand kind of what made him tick. Uh, it was that sense that he could project innocence, that he could project uh, a sense of duty and that uh, venality that really made Ronald Reagan such a successful politician. So while he's politely deflecting requests to stump for Gerald Ford, uh, he's throwing his full-throated support behind insurgent Republican candidates for Absolutely. other offices, uh, most That's notably right. Orrin Hatch in Utah. That's right. So 1976, he's also building a political machine, right? He's kind of doing what, what Richard Nixon did in the middle of the 1960s, leading into his own 1968 presidential campaign. And in fact, with the same operative, a guy named John Sears, helping him out. And, and he forms his own political action committee that has a newsletter. So he has his own kind of conservative magazine where he writes a column and his you know, pictures on the front. Uh, there's a membership card. I have one. Uh, you know, he's in the night going into the 1976 election. He stumps for his preferred candidates, underdog Orrin Hatch, who pr probably owes his Senate seat to him. Going into 1978, he he gives over 250 appearances for Republican candidates, you know, all the way down to, you know, county board members. He's collecting chits. He's doing what you do to run for president at the same time as he's kind of insisting to people in his private letters that he's not running for president. Um. So I want to talk about how the the campaign mechanics of this period prefigured the, the decades of politics mm -hmm. to come. This is kind of the, among other things, the dawn of the era of direct mail, which is uh, the lowest tech version of the micro targeting that uh, has dominated campaign approaches on social media today. But it's not particularly low tech at all, certainly for the time. So the guy behind this is a remarkable figure who I dwell at at, at some length in the, in the book named Richard Vigory. He's called the godfather of the new right. And the new right are the people who kind of started their political odyssey in the Goldwater campaign. And they saw how Gold, Goldwater lost by giving this unvarnished economic conservatism, you know, arguing, arguing against social security, you know, arguing to, for the Tennessee values authority to be privatized, you know, arguing for a very militant position against the Soviet Union. And they see that this is a political loser. And what they realize is that there are all these social issues that are causing all sorts of confusion, anxiety, rage across the land. And one of the main new right operatives says, uh, he puts it this way, he says, sex is the Achilles heel of the liberal Democrats. So they kind of pick up these very emotional issues like abortion, like feminism, like gay rights. And they build these very lowest common denominator campaigns in which they uh, have these massive mailing lists that exist on you know, mainframe computers. And they just flood the zone with these letters that Richard Vigory wrote that uh, are as feral and angry and frightening as anything we saw last night at the Republican National Convention. The idea that liberals uh, are want to um, force homosexuals to teach in the schools, the idea that uh, feminists want to force women to get jobs, force bathrooms to be co-ed, uh, 
uh, get rid of co-ed, get rid of uh, gender segregated prisons, absolutely terrifying stuff. And they are doing this pretty much under the radar. Uh, Richard Vigory says direct mail is like an anaconda. Uh, it's uh, silent but deadly. And what happens in the congressional elections in 1978 is all the pundits, all the pollsters are saying, well, it looks like it's not going to be a very interesting election. Uh, both sides are pretty much tied. And conservative Republicans way outperform expectations. And no one really understands why until they realize that people are getting these letters that are absolutely terrifying them. And that really is the foundation of the kind of lowest common denominator electioneering uh, we see so prevalently uh, in the Republican Party today. In fact, one of the big direct mail campaigns uh, is uh, aimed at scotching uh, a proposal by Jimmy Carter to make registering to vote easier. And that absolutely goes down the tubes once conservatives can uh, convince the mainstream of the Republican Party that if this happens, more African-Americans will vote, more labor union members will vote. And as uh, one of the new right propagandists, a guy who later turned liberal, Kevin Phillips says, it will be euthanasia for the Republican Party. So, so I want to back up a sec. I mean, you just described abortion as, as something that the new right latched onto as an issue they saw polarizing the electorate in a useful way. Um, but this is also a period when the religious right is kind of self-organizing as, as a political force. And, and this is coming out of the, the Catholic church and some evangelical denominations as mm -hmm. well. Yes, that's an independent force uh, that the new right decides to pick up later for kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, mercenary reasons. Um, Roe versus Wade passes in 1973, uh, passes the Supreme Court in 1973, legalizes abortion. And the Catholic Church, of course, is the absolute epicenter of uh, anti-abortion sentiment. Uh, it's not a particularly big deal among evangelical and fundamentalist Protestants, and not a very big deal among kind of white Southern conservatives. In fact, uh, George Wallace was pro-abortion uh, on racial terms. He said that uh, a lot of these African-American women, uh, what he would call something else, were um, practically turning into breeding farms in order to get welfare, right? So it was a very nasty, you know, kind of uh, population control argument for abortion. Um, but as people begin to think about abortion in terms of uh, something that licenses women to have control over their reproduction uh, and allows people to have, you know, sex outside of the bounds of marriage, um, it becomes more and more a conservative evangelical issue. And Christianity Today, which is kind of the, the, the flagship evangelical magazine started by, uh, started by Billy Graham, uh, says, you know, you really should consider joining this movement. It's not all Catholics. It's not like this, you know, Roman plot anymore. And uh, it really um, stirs the emotions of people pretty profoundly, such that by 1978, in one of the Senate races I cover in Iowa, uh, a new branch of a new um, pro-life political action committee prints tens of thousands of pamphlets uh, that have uh, a photograph, a very famous photograph by a science photographer uh, named Linert. Uh, they're photographs of um, fetuses in the womb. They run in Life magazine in 1965. Ironically, they're of dead fetuses, but uh, they look like these kind of shimmering diaphanous, angelic figures. And they, they put these um, pamphlets underneath the windshield wipers of people while they're in church in Sunday, on Sunday, in Catholic churches in, uh, or outside evangelical churches. So they see them just as they get out of church three days before the Tuesday election. And um, the candidate on whose behalf these pamphlets uh, are placed wins this astounding upset. He's, he's backed by 20 points in the polls. And people realize that this is some kind of uh, electoral dynamite issue. And that it's the, the reason it's, it's so um, dynamic and also so frightening for a lot of people is that it really seems to be this issue of moral absolutes. Uh, and matter of fact, parallel to this, you know, kind of electoral pro-life movement, we see the first inklings of pro-life terrorism. We see abortion clinic bombings that kind of uh, the more the more sort of loud and out and proud the anti-abortion movement becomes, uh, the more we see uh, anti-abortion terrorism 
So I want to uh, kind of untangle cause and effect on that for a second. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, it's politically advantageous to embrace abortion as an issue. At its inception, mm -hmm. is it a sincere political issue or is it about that op political opportunity? Um, I that, that That's something I don't have a good answer for. I certainly can find cynical examples of that. Uh, certainly in the case of George H.W. Bush, when he's, you know, running full bore for the 1980 uh, nomination and he's being chased around by uh, pro-life activists on the ground in 1979 in New Hampshire who are harassing him and shouting him down. Uh, he mutters almost to himself, but, the, but with an earshot of the reporter Robert Novak, what the hell am I going to do about these people? And Robert Novak, you know, doesn't mutter. He says, change your position. Uh, George Bush was, of course, comes from this kind of, he's a scion of this uh, establishment Wall Street family. His his dad was a senator and close friends with Dwight Eisenhower and, you know, a uh, member of uh, uh, all sorts of uh, Yale secret societies and was kind of pretty much as close as you could get as a to an establishment Eastern Republican. And George Bush in his one term in Congress uh, becomes known by the nickname Rubbers because he's such an enthusiastic enthusiast for international family planning programs, which again has this sort of ugly sort of we need to keep the dangerous people from breeding element to it. And uh, he does change his position. He immediately uh, comes out for a, a constitutional amendment uh, banning abortion, which was kind of the extreme position. Uh, so that's one example where it's clearly done for cynical political reasons. I think that abortion for a lot of conservative minded Christian Americans becomes a symbol, right? It becomes a symbol of the liberty that was unleashed by the 1960s. And one of the big themes all throughout this book, whether it's people becoming terrified of the new sexual mores that the 1960s unleashed, or thinking about inflation as kind of the government getting out of control, this idea that society has gotten out of control that we need to kind of put a break on uh, all the familiar uh, boundaries of social life. That's a big theme of the book. So I don't see any reason to suggest that when people are calling abortion murder and uh, talking about babies being killed, uh, I have a picture in the, of a protest in the book in which a woman holds up a sign that says, uh, babies are endangered species, or you know, someone holding up a sign at the Democratic convention in the Missouri section uh, of the floor uh, with a picture of a little girl saying, if you kill me now, it's murder. If you kill me when I'm in the womb, it's, it's, it's legal, right? I have no reason to think that that wasn't absolutely sincere. So the, the kind of third innovation of the new right uh, that you chronicle during this period is not classic conservatism, but uh, channeling working class populist right. sentiment. But, right. but taking the resentment that the, the left might target at bosses and owners of industry and directing it at bureaucrats, regulators, and the media instead. Yeah, a classic example of that is something I write about in my previous book, Invisible Bridge, in 1974 in Carnau County, West Virginia, which is basically the county that encompasses uh, uh, um, uh, um, what's the big city in uh, West Virginia. Um, um, that uh, the school board uh, institutes new textbooks that uh, basically we call multi multicultural textbooks now. And the fundamentalist Christians in the rural areas absolutely go berserk. That sort of their way of life is being traduced by these textbooks and becomes such a profound, such a galvanizing issue that the protesters literally dynamite the school board building, right? And a big thing about the new right is that they're actually actively scanning the horizon for anger uh, on the ground that they can turn into political anger to elect conservative candidates. So what the Heritage Foundation does, which starts that year in 1974 as a new right think tank, what they do is they send down lawyers to help defend the people who are accused of dynamiting the school board. But they also hook them up with uh, people who are uh, protesting against uh, uh, satanic textbooks all across the country. So what you see are these organizational networks being born that uh, are really reaching into the uh, the world of sort of white blue collar working class America? 
and they make that very much a part of their identity. And the people who are the leaders of the New Right often come from blue collar identities themselves. Uh, Richard Vigory, the godfather of the New Right, uh, his dad worked in an oil and gas factory and his mom sold cow, uh, milk from the family cow. You know, one of the big uh, new, new right leaders' dad was a manager of a Sears in Bridgeport, Connecticut. There are people who feel um, uh, dispossessed from the Republican Party. They call it a country club Republican Party. And they're trying to make kind of the Republican Party and the conservative movement safe for working class Americans, which, of course, is enormously influential in the decades to come. So when you describe all these forces coming together, the, the Christian right, uh, the, the new right's rhetorical twist on populism, uh, the new machinery of appealing to resentment in political campaigns through direct mail, does that make you think of Reagan as someone who drove history or someone who was a product of history? Did the moment pick him or did he figure out how to capitalize on the moment? Uh, it's 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 the old um, it's the old uh, war and peace you know kind of uh, uh, um, is is history made by individuals or is history made uh, by structures uh, when you when you when you look closely at Ronald Reagan and how he did politics and what he did for conservatism his influence really was quite unique and individual uh, we think of him most prominently as this guy who brought this kind of genial optimism to conservatism, which, you know, really in a lot of ways was uh, a discourse of American carnage. In, in that sense, uh, Donald Trump is kind of a, a return to form uh, rather than anything new. And one of the things that was so useful uh, uh, about Ronald Reagan as a figure head for the conservative movement was that he was so useful, so important for kind of smoothing off these rough edges. You know, he was able to convince people that they could um, support conservative policies and not consider themselves bigots, right? He was a guy who uh, was able to um, uh, focus this rage at the government while convincing people that being uh, rageful at the government did not make them anti-American, did not make them unpatriotic. So he's certainly unique in that sense. But also he's, he's, he's clearly a product of uh, his environment in many, many ways. You know, he, he, he comes from, you know, uh, a very kind of um, insular and non-cosmopolitan, you know, kind of region in the middle of Illinois. His mother is a fundamentalist Christian. Uh, he, um, of course, famously becomes a liberal during the New Deal, but uh as someone upwardly mobile, you know, kind of during the 1940s and the 1950s, comes more and more to identify with sort of like the American century kind of uh, celebration of America as kind of God's chosen nation and becomes closer and closer to uh, uh, the people who are, he begins to see as the real heroes, the real cowboys of society, entrepreneurs, right? So uh, he definitely kind of comes from somewhere. Uh, and uh, it's really a meeting of the man and the movement that creates Reagan land. Hmm. Uh, Rick Perlstein, before we get to audience questions, um, I, I want to pick up on the, the questions of the through line from Reaganism mm. to Trumpism. Mm -hmm. um, do you see what Donald Trump represents as something that's building on what Reagan did 40 years ago or an abrupt departure from, from the party that Ronald Reagan helped build? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's a very complicated question. It's why these books are so long in a sense, but um, you know, history really is the study of continuity and change and uh, they're present in equal measure in the story that leads from uh, Barry Goldwater to Donald Trump. Uh, the continuities are certainly there in the feral, angry, often violent reactionary energies that one sees in the movement, uh, without which Ronald Reagan is inconceivable. I've, I find myself kind of turning back to this uh, quote from Pat Robertson, right? The, the televangelist who becomes, you know, such an important mover and shaker in the political movement that eventually he runs for president himself. In 1978, he's, you know, talking about Jimmy Carter. And he, he says the reason he's turned away from Jimmy Carter is that God wants stability. It's better to have a stable government under a crook than turmoil, turmoil under an honest man. So when you look at something like that, it's hard to see something like the Christian rights embrace of Donald Trump as uh, something that's not completely 
continuous with the, the religious right since its birth. Uh, at the same time, uh, there's very little continuity in the sort of personalities of a figure like Donald Trump and Ronald Reagan. Uh, Ronald Reagan was someone who understood that his job as a politician was to be very careful about what he said and to keep some things under wraps, right? Uh, I wrote an article uh, that came out in the New Republic a couple of weeks ago in which I compared the letters that his advisors wrote for him to sign, uh, which were almost universally aimed at kind of mainstream respectable figures and were intended to uh, represent Ronald Reagan as a sort of mainstream figure within the broad, you know, center of respectable opinion. And they would be things like uh, Ronald Reagan would sign a letter saying to an intellectual sent him a book. This is a wonderful book. It taught me a lot. And then I, I point out that the, the cover note to Governor Reagan directing him to the send the letter said, don't feel obliged to read the book. Right. So this is a very different Ronald Reagan uh, compared to the Ronald Reagan that one finds in his letters that he dictates to friends. Uh, and they're often uh, just, just, just downright wacky. You know, it's um, let's talk about, you know, how um, uh, the prophecies in the Bible, you know, uh, uh, help us understand what's happening in the Middle East right now. You know, there are letters to the newspaper psychic, you know, Gene Dixon. There's letters to the, the far right newspaper publisher, uh, William Loeb in New Hampshire, who thinks that National Guard commanders in New Hampshire should be issued nuclear weapons. Right. So um, there's kind of a front stage Reagan and there's a backstage Reagan. And sometimes the two, the, the backstage Reagan would kind of emerge into public consciousness, like we need to say something crazy, like when he said in 1986 that uh, South Africa has made more racial progress than America had, right? And that became news because he did it fairly, fairly infrequently. I think there's no front stage Donald Trump, and backstage Donald Trump. What you see is what you get. You know, if we suddenly were, uh, if, if, if the, the Donald Trump Oval Office tapes drop from the heavens tomorrow, nothing we heard in them would particularly surprise us, right? Uh, so he's also a sweet, generous figure, completely without precedent in American politics, but his rise is inconceivable without the forces that Ronald Reagan was able to marshal for his victory in 1980. It's an interesting through line because like when you talk about the new right, you describe a, a group of people who are rooted in an ideological agenda, right? A very mm -hmm. libertarian approach to government and a very cold warrior approach to, to foreign policy. Yeah. Who then decide that to make this a politically successful endeavor, they have to cloak it in populism and appeals to fear and resentment. Right. Um, and, and come and, to, by, by the way, embody those fear and resentments themselves, because that's what happens when you begin defining your political identity according to something like that. So, for example, a figure like Howard Phillips becomes a Christian reconstructionist. And, you know, that's a movement that thinks that gays should be stoned, you know, in the public square, for example. So he might start out as a cynic, but he comes to be a believer by the time you know, the story is over. So we're, we're having this conversation uh, just after the beginning of the Republican National Convention. Um, that, that aspires to kick off the second term of Donald Trump. And, and it's a convention that explicitly has no platform. Like the, there no longer appears to be an ideological project That's right. behind the politics. Uh, the resentment that was supposed to, to wrap it and sell it to the public has become the politics. That's right. Um, it's an apotheosis of forces we see present in the 1970s, certainly. So speaking about the 1970s, I'm wondering if we could ground this uh, in the place that Ronald Reagan came out of, which is the, mm -hmm. the state I'm connecting to you from, California. Mm -hmm. um, I thought we were going to talk about had, Illinois, where he was born. He had been uh, in the state's political establishment. He was governor, fairly mm -hmm. traditional law and order governor. Um, but while he's in that interregnum mm -hmm. before his successful campaign for presidency, he's watching a lot of uh, grassroots right wing ferment here. Mm -hmm. uh, most notable would probably be the, the campaign that passed uh, the first of the great tax revolts, Proposition mm -hmm. 13, yeah. uh, over the objections of leadership from both political parties. That's right. What, what do you think he's learning watching that while he has an eye on the presidency? 
I don't think he has anything to learn from what's happening in the Proposition 13 campaign because that's pretty much what he goes in what he goes in to the Proposition campaign believing. In fact, a big inspiration for the Proposition 13 campaign was a tax limitation initiative he tried and failed to pass in 1973. Uh, one thing, uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Proposition 13. That's an excellent example of kind of the Trumpian energies that were present in the Reagan movement that were, that for which his, you know, kind of success was impossible in the absence of those energies. The guy who started the uh, Proposition 13 movement, this guy, Howard Jarvis, this very uh, angry, colorful, populist character. For, 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 for one thing, he was just as much a con man as any member of the Trump family, right? In 1964, he had his own independent uh, campaign committee for Barry Goldwater, in which he just pocketed the money and gave none to Barry Goldwater. And then he did it again uh, in the Senate campaign in 1976 for S.I. Hayakawa. But when the Proposition 13 campaign began, uh, the guys who were the campaign managers, much like the campaign managers for Ronald Reagan, were terrified that he would say something crazy in public. So they tried to keep him as far from the cameras as possible. But whenever he did speak before the cameras, it was such a sensation because there was so much populist rage that suddenly he became the figurehead for the entire movement. So he would think, say things like, I can't wait to ram a red hot poker up these politicians' butts, right? So this is, uh, you know, not exactly polite, optimistic language. This is American carnage language. And uh, the Proposition 13 campaign, despite Jerry Brown, the governor, saying it was crazy and unworkable, does win by a margin of two to one. And Jerry, Jerry Brown, for reasons of ambition, immediately jumps on the Proposition 13 bandwagon after it passes to such an extent that when Californians are polled, the majority believe that he'd been for it all along. Yeah, it's, it seems like the real significance of this moment is um, how it moves the politics of both parties. Uh, the way the way you describe uh, Carter's successful run at the presidency and, and whopping failure to get reelected really seems to describe a Democratic Party that's a, a little bit adrift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, the fascinating thing about Jimmy Carter's campaign to get reelected in 1976 is his skill at being all things to all people. You know, he does have pro gun control support and anti gun control support, you know, pro abortion support and anti abortion support, business support and labor support, because he's really running uh, on, on a platform of symbols. You know, he's the guy who won't lie to you. You know, he's the guy who wears flannel shirts. He is the guy who's a peanut farmer. He's, you know, the guy who's the absolute opposite of, uh, of, Richard Nixon, you know, who lied and lied and lied and lied. And he's the guy who's going to re redeem America from the shame of defeat in Vietnam. But when you run and win as the candidate who seems like all things to all people, you're setting yourself for a dangerous fall once you have to govern and make decisions. And one thing he didn't run on was the identity that was closest to his heart. And that was the idea that America could only thrive if the American people sacrificed, if they pulled in their belts, if they did more with less. Uh, this is something he shared with Jerry Brown, who, if anything, attacked Carter on that issue from the right. Uh, so um, once Jimmy Carter is up for re-election against this guy, Ronald Reagan, who says America doesn't have any problems, and uh, that sort of negativity and pessimism is un-American, and says, not only do we have to tight, do we have to not tighten our belts? I promise to give every American a thirty percent tax cut. It's it's it really gives uh, Ronald Reagan a very strong structural advantage in appealing to all voters, but especially working class voters. And that's a big dynamic that he takes into the November election when he wins that landslide. I'm curious what you think about the the parallels today. Um, I mean, what, what you're describing is the dynamic where someone who's built their political appeal to the electorate on being a decent person who has unobjectionable policy positions. Right. Um, that pretty much describes the Biden campaign. And, and it, in that instance did not fare very well in an right. environment where the other campaign was able to force a series of polarizing yes, no political positions. Uh, Abortion was not a litmus test right. before the late seventies in American politics. Right. The difference between Jimmy Carter uh, and Joe Biden, who was, by the way, the first person to support uh, Jimmy Carter in the Senate in 1976, is pretty profound in that Joe Biden has been doing it, you know, for for 30 years. Uh, 
and he's nothing if not a profoundly political person. The extent to which Jimmy Carter thought he could succeed uh, as a president without practicing politics at all is just jaw dropping. It's mm-hmm. absolutely astonishing. You know, literally the first thing he does as president is because he's an engineer and he thinks like an engineer. So he reads the Army Corps of Engineers uh, report on the water projects that they have going on all over the country. He picks 50 that he thinks are not sustainable on their own terms on kind of economically rational terms and just outright cancel them, cancels them without any consultation with uh, the congressmen in whose districts these projects exist for whom their political survival depends. And that's how contemptuous he was of the basic work of politics. You know, uh, there's a there's a inaugural concert, you know, at, at, at Lincoln Center. Tip O'Neill, the one person who whose loyalty uh, he needs in order to get anything done in Washington, gets a seat in the top balcony. And then when he calls to complain, uh, uh, um, Jimmy Carter's um, number one aide, Hamilton Jordan, who has no experience in Washington and whose only experience was working for Jimmy Carter in Georgia, says, well, would you like your money back, right? So like, they, 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 there's no political game playing. There's this amazing moment in Jimmy Carter's diary in which a new law is passed, giving him the power to appoint 200 new federal judges, completely new uh, federal judicial positions, giving him the opportunity to completely transform uh, and set his stamp on the federal judiciary for a decade to come. And what does he do? He complains. He complains that he has this power. He had so much contempt for the idea of politics as the storing and gaining of power. He believed that politics should be um, basically this very, very rationalist, you know, kind of set of calculations, uh, almost like, you know, kind of doing uh, trigonometry. Uh, so, you know, that could not be a more night and day difference from a guy like Joe Biden, who's been a builder and store of political power, power for good or ill for, you know, since 1972, when he entered the Senate as a 29 year old. Let's go to some of our audience questions. And uh, a a reminder to everyone who's viewing live, uh, ask your questions through the chat function on YouTube, uh, and they will get to me and I will try to get them to Rick. So the first gets to the question of whether some of the backlash politics of the 70s were um, kind of sincere Mm -hmm. or opportunistic. And and this is a question about the fight against the ERA that was led by Mm -hmm. Phyllis Schlafly. recently depicted in the Mrs. America television series. Um, This person wants to know if you agree with the critique that Gloria Steinem wrote up, which is that it's depicted as an army of housewives, but actually a a coordinated effort barked by corporate forces and money. That's an uncomfortable question because as much as I respect Gloria Steinem as a hero who's done more to advance human rights, you know, uh, than I could ever dream of in a million lifetimes. There's simply no evidence that that's the case. And it's, uh, it represents a very kind of dangerous uh, strategic direction for people on the left to go in, which is basically not to take their opponents seriously. Uh, by every evidence, my own primary research and every scholar who's looked deeply into it, um, this was basically a movement of mostly housewives, not exclusively. Some of them were actually single women uh, who uh, self-organized under the leadership of Flafley uh, and, and were absolutely brilliant at finding the pressure points to win uh, one state legislative vote after another you know, uh, through tactics like, you know, they did, you know, bake bread and deliver it to, you know, uh, state senators, uh, pouring, pouring, pouring letters to, to each other, uh, to, to lobbying letters, lobbying at key movements, uh, winning uh, the loyalty of key male allies. And it doesn't really respect women, not to acknowledge the extent to which this was a, women, a movement that was kind of built and won by women. And on the other side, uh, the, 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 the main bureaucratic organization to fight for the ERA, it was called ER, ERA America, it was ERA America, uh, was only convened in 1975, three years into the fight, after uh, two big initiative campaigns in New York and New Jersey had been lost. So as tempting as it is to believe that there is some kind of hidden right-wing corporate string pullers from behind the scenes. There's simply no evidence that is the case. 
Another question about uh, where our conversation started off, which was Reagan working to take over the Republican Party by backing insurgent candidates running against uh, establishment figures. Um, this member of our audience would like to know if, if you see a parallel uh, today in, in the types of Republicans that have rode Trumpism into office. Absolutely. Uh, one of the tragedies for America, I say this as a, a liberal and a partisan Democrat, were um, how many great, great public servants, senators, lost their seats in 1978 to really non-entities who had you know, no business being in the Senate. Senate. I'm talking about senators like George McGovern, Birch Bayh, who was responsible for three constitutional amendments, um, people like uh, Gaylord Nelson, who formed Earth Day. And I mean, if I listed to you the senators who used, you know, direct mail and Richard Vigory and uh, these new insurgent energies uh, to become senators for one term or two terms, you wouldn't even recognize a lot of the names. Uh, and um, a lot of them, you know, had had, you know, one was a former airline pilot. You know, which is a perfectly respectable profession with but uh, with no um, no political experience, and it's okay. You know, I, I don't mind people you know winning office and becoming public servants with no political experience, but uh, the the caliber of people they defeated uh, um, was a real loss to American public life. But the in the present moment. Um... Like Donald Trump himself seems to be right. torn between backing people who mimic him rhetorically and politically uh, and backing people who his political advisors think are more electable. Right, right. Uh, in the case of Ronald Reagan, actually, he uh, was very careful about who he backed. Uh, in fact, he had a giant bureaucracy at his uh, a political action camp uh, committee. Um, I found, you know, giant uh, um, books of polling results on the most obscure, you know, congressional races. They were doing all kinds of research about who could win. Now, often they were, um, you know, backing people who, you know, were political newcomers. But there was actually, uh, now that I think of it, and the book is big, and sometimes I even forget what's in there. There were civil wars within the Reagan organization about who to back. Uh, you know, uh, just to, you know, take one example, um, there was a guy named Arnold Stangeland, you know, another guy who, you know, didn't really, you know, go anywhere. And he was a guy who came out of nowhere to win a special election to replace the congressman who became Jimmy Carter's um, transportation secretary. And, uh, you know, he was, he was you know, no one thought he, he had a chance. Uh, and uh, when he did become congressman, his first legislation was a bill that he filed to abrogate all Native American treaties, right? So a real wingnut. Uh, the guy who ran uh, Reagan's uh, political action committee was a guy named Lynn Nofziger, who people might remember from the Reagan era. Uh, and he absolutely wanted to go all in on this crazy new right candidate. And the people who kind of ran Ra the other half of Reagan's political organization, uh, Michael Deaver, who became a very high White House official, and another guy named Peter Hannaford were like, no, we, we have to aim for respectability. So this sort of um, battle between the people in Reagan's camp who were conservative ideologues who, whose watchword was let Reagan be Reagan and the kind of people who uh, wanted to market Reagan uh, as a member of the establishment to uh, two members of the establishment that affords a lot of the drama that I depict in the book actually and then it's something that uh, one found uh, as a defining battle within the White House uh, and it reached its apotheosis with Iran-Contra which was really kind of the right wing let Reagan be Reagan crazy people in the basement trying to kind of take over American foreign policy from the, you know the State Department which was seen as kind of completely you know the swamp you know the deep state as people would say it now so that's kind of a structural feature uh, one of those things that you know one finds within the Reagan firmament which is kind of turned up to 11 within sort of the Trump era yeah. On that note, and, and I apologize because this takes us a little bit outside the uh, time bounds of your latest history, but at, how did those movement conservatives who gathered around Reagan when he was nominally in the political wilderness, mm -hmm. how did they feel about him once he was in office? That's a really interesting question, actually. Uh, there's um, a good book by a guy named Marcus Witcher, uh, which is about 
conservatives' response to Reagan when he was president. And uh, I think that the cliche, the presumption is that they, they revered him, right? He was one of them. Uh, really, they only kind of reached this consensus that Reagan was the greatest human being ever to walk, walk the earth after he left office. Uh, and they kind of retroactively kind of um, rewrote history uh, that they were all Reagan loyalists. But, you know, people like Richard Vigory were always going after him for selling out conservatives, conservatism, people like George Will, uh, all kinds of issues. And that was because basically the White House was run by uh, establishment figures, you know, people like uh, Senator Howard Baker, who became his chief of staff, people like James Baker, you know, people like Edmund Meese, who um, sometimes had conservative ideologies, sometimes did not have as much conservative ideologies. Uh, but their first and foremost concern was um, governing, right? Uh, that's how Ronald Reagan ran the state house. You know, he basically turned it over to people who were experts in governing the state of California. And uh, the striking thing about Ronald Reagan's popularity is the things we remember uh, that he was most effective at, like negotiating with the Soviet Union, were the things that the conservatives most readily reviled. You know, they thought he was a sellout for, 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 for talking to this communist Gorbachev. If, if he had listened to the conservatives, his, his presidency would, would have been a, 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 a profound failure. He and his staff are also uh, in the position of having to deal with Democrat-controlled Senate and House. Yeah. And, you know, presidents do not choose, you know, what fights they get to win, uh, you know, out, out of a catalog. They have to, you know, I mean, when people always point out, oh, Richard Nixon was far to the left of uh, the Republicans now. Well, it's not really true. I mean, if you look at the budget he proposed after his 1972 landslide, it was just as radical as, you know, anything that Ronald Reagan ever proposed. But yeah, he was dealing with a House of Representatives that was two to one Democrat. So of course, he, you know, signed things like uh, clean air legislation, because when he uh, didn't sign them, his vetoes were overridden. Um, on that tip, one of our audience members would like your assessment on whether he was actually effective at working with legislation, getting bills through. Um, sometimes yes. And sometimes no, uh, he, uh, he was in fact a compromiser. He was a guy who did say a half loaf is better than no loaf. He, uh, signed several tax increases because his tax cuts were so disastrous. Um, a lot of what he did, uh, to use a phrase that's become, uh, better known now because of Steve Bannon was basically the stuff that was within the administrative state. Uh, that had nothing to do with legislation, uh, things like um, judicial nominees, right? Uh, things like rewiring the Justice Department. Uh, that was, you know, Ed Meese's work. Um, things uh, like uh, manage, managing to pass budgets that um, cut, you know, uh, public housing by 80%, right? So he got, he got conservative successes where he could, and he abandoned the fight where he couldn't. I'm struck, uh, I think the first time I met you in person, we were both at the 2008 Republican National Convention. Oh, and how that I was an era in politics uh, when every single person who got more than 60 seconds at the dais would name check Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. I've been watching what I can of this year's Republican National Convention yeah. and uh, his star seems to have fallen yeah. within the party. Yeah, I think that's a generational thing. You know, I mean, I think it, you, you probably remember that there was a day when, you know, every young Democrat was called Kennedy-esque and everyone was trying to like, you know, kind of keep the Kennedy manual, mantle all the way into the 80s and 90s. And then eventually just kind of faded away because, you know, young voters, you know, are young voters and they, they have a different set of references. Hmm. You're not uh, politically of the right. No, I'm not. You don't not. share the politics of the right. No, I don't. Why, why spend the last two and a half decades writing cultural histories of it? <laughs> Well, you'll have to ask my shrink, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. That's what I'm serious about. <laughs> no, no uh, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons. Uh, I was uh, first obsessed with the 60s when I was a young person and read everything I could about it and was obsessed with the idea of a time when everything seemed to be up in the air. And then when I kind of... Uh, went to New York and became an editor and a writer and I was looking for a book project. It was kind of uh, a lacuna in the literature of the 1960s and no one wrote about the fact that in a lot of ways, 
the left lost in a lot of ways the right won. A lot of ways the left won and a lot of ways the right lost. But the idea of the 60s as a civil war between the left and the right was something that it took a generation of scholars and writers who are, were post baby boomers, and I was born in 1969, to more fully appreciate. I mean, you could read histories called the 60s uh, by a guy like Todd Gitlin, and Barry Goldwater wouldn't even show up in the index, right? Because the 60s was the battle for liberation, civil rights. It was the anti-war movement. Uh, and there's other reasons. I, I've just, you know, I, I'm fascinated by the thing that fascinates me the most about the United States is how it manages to contain within its boundaries all these incommensurate tribes who share very few fundamental assumptions about how the world does and should work. And the idea that we can kind of be anthropologists of each other has always uh, tickled me. And once I started writing about this, and you know, it kind of it became my niche, uh, I found how useful people found it on the left. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, my next book being a short book called The Republican Playbook, in which I much more explicitly say, here's the stuff, here's how the Republicans do it, here's how they can more effectively be countered. Um, and, you know, having people say that it, my work gives them a measure of comfort in understanding that this stuff can be kind of understood, that it can kind of be reverse engineered uh, is something that has given me a lot of satisfaction over the years. And it's given me a lot of satisfaction precisely as someone whose goal is, you know, achieving, you know, social dem democratic policy in the United States. Um, 1,100 pages. Mm -hmm. Well, you're talking about the index and, and the acknowledgements and the 900 pages of text. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's number four in a tetralogy. Yeah. Could you walk us through what, the work of assembling the, the level of detail that goes into these books entails? Well, obviously, uh, there's, a, there's um, a little bit of obsession involved, right? Uh, and I take on a subject in which, you know, it can be, you know, all consuming, you know, like any book that covers the period that I'm writing about can have something in it, you know, that's relevant to the work I'm doing. You know, every newspaper page could have something that's relevant to the work I'm doing. So my basic orientation in pulling together the research for this stuff, is first of all, to make just a pile of information uh, that's as big as possible and consider that kind of like the chunk of marble that has the book inside it that I'm kind of whittling away to the shape and size that it is. Uh, but what I try and do is when I'm assembling this information, uh, there's of course, things like policy history and what goes on inside the White House and what goes on in the Senate and what goes on inside campaigns. That's a part of the book too. But the actual cultural history part of the book, and you describe me as a cultural historian, and I'll definitely cop that label, is an attempt to assemble what an ordinary uh, alert consumer of politics and culture at the time might come across in a typical day and a typical week. And it's very much... Uh, fundamental to the paradigm of the kind of history I do that I don't recognize a hard and fast barrier between culture and politics, movies, novels, uh, television commercials. I don't recognize a hard and fast barrier between economics and politics. Uh, the fact that, you know, um, uh, American wages were starting to stagnate uh, just as the feminist movement is coming about as a big force in American life has a lot to do with the fact that women were going to work for the service time sometimes equally and sometimes not just to be able to maintain the same class status that they enjoyed previously. It's about how people live. It's about how people experience the world. It's about how people shape their destinies and shape the nation's destinies out of the everyday stuff and the everyday dilemmas and the everyday challenges and the everyday satisfactions of life in the United States. That, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty does that answer stunning. Your question? <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to imagine a, a, a life in the, a day in the life of intrepid cultural historian, Rick Perlstein, uh, that results in a book where, where you are able to narrate what the stage directions are in the teleprompter script used for well, a Reagan. That's serendipity, right? I mean, in, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the finished book that people can buy, in the photo section, I actually have that teleprompter page, which, you know, you're just turning pages in the archive and there it is. And when it says, you know, you hear, you know, Jimmy Carter, I mean, Ronald Reagan, you see, you know, the words that 
Ronald Reagan is giving for a speech and then it says, sit on chair, you know, you realize that you have, you know, you're, you're suddenly reaching back through that time machine and, you know, kind of you have a document that, you know, touches the real experience of what something that happened, you know, like um, 44 years ago. And it's very exciting. You know, it's a document that, you know, that, as we say, as historians, singes the fingers, you know? Yeah. Who do you think of as your audience? Like who, who, who do you think of reading these books and what do you want them to learn from it? When I, um, my, my favorite job as a journalist was when I was the national correspondent for the Village Voice because the Village Voice was in a free paper. Village Voice doesn't exist anymore. You know, it's the big weekly alternative paper in New York. And the idea that someone could pick up a Village Voice, leave it on a subway bench, and that someone else, you know, who might not think about write, reading about, you know, political stuff in an ordinary day would pick it up, read an article of mine just completely at random and be sucked into it. That was the greatest satisfaction. So in that sense, you know, I would like, I, I imagine the possibility, right, that literally any literate person could pick up a page of my work and be pulled into it, right? Uh, whatever their interests. So that's a fantasy, right? That's like an ideal. Um, but a lot of the reason I write the way I do uh, and write with as much charm and seduction as possible and sort of lapel grabbing, uh, attention grabbing, you know, kind of style is because, you know, I don't want my audience only to be political junkies. I don't want it only to be left wingers. I don't want it only to be right wingers. Uh, you know, we talked about my shrink earlier, you know, I want to be listened to, I want to be heard, you know, uh, maybe I w wasn't heard, you know, to the extent I wanted to be when I was young. And that's something I want to redeem. And that's my compulsion. And so far, it's worked out pretty good for me. Do you ever think of, of someone trying to do the same work uh, that you've done, but about this period? I mean, even up, up through the 1970s, yeah, There's I mean, only a, a limited of, number of national media outlets to peruse to kind oh, of put your finger right. on the cultural pulse of the times. Right. Uh, we do have a lot of detritus. <laughs> That's true. Uh, I think about that all the time. A lot of times because people ask me to think about it. Uh, almost every day in Twitter, someone says, you know, 2050 Rick Perlstein is going to, you know, have this detail in his book, you know, or something like that. So uh, the style in which I write is a way people have begun to think about in the present as well as the future. Um, people think about that, actually. There's some really good work being done in digital history about, you know, how do you use big data? And, you know, how do you sort of figure out which words or which tropes people are using the most on Twitter? Uh, the fact of the matter is, if you think of the metaphor of a coral reef, you know, if you, if you look at each piece of coral, you know, you're going to get completely bogged down. But the coral, the coral, as they kind of form a structure, a barrier that actually, you know, is visible, you know, sometimes from outer space, it has a structure to it, right? So um, even a trillion pieces of information can settle in a way that are recognizable and predictable, right? Um, and it simply isn't the fact that the internet completely changes the way information is consumed and the way it changes people's behavior. After all, um, you know, uh, the Bush administration had no problem, you know, assembling a completely coherent and very simple conspiracy theory about uh, about uh, Saddam Hussein having weapons of mass destruction and creating a dominant narrative that was um, amplified by all sorts of politicians, both conservative and democratic, uh, even though, you know, uh, there weren't only three networks, you know, and only three newspapers and two news services. Oh, right? I, so I want to I want to push back on you on that because I, I think it's true that there was cable news then. Right. So there was some like ideologically segmented national outlets, but the blogosphere hadn't even come into its own. Oh, I mean, absolutely. It had. Yeah. In 2003, 2004. I was there, man. Oh, OK. <laughs> but, I think uh, it, it had, but, you know, it, I think, it, I think the, the point I'm trying to make is um, you can have a million people saying a million things, but they kind of sort themselves out into discourses that are recognizable, right? And they're not gonna be a million original things that are all different from each other, right? Uh, and if you take a stratified sample of you know, a million tweets, you're gonna find patterns, you're gonna find trends. Uh, and um, yeah, people are thinking about that in really interesting ways. The Internet Archive thinks about that in really interesting ways. Uh, and the fact of the matter is there's always an infinity of information to draw on. You know, um, but it's also true that um, the way narratives are shaped 
tend to fall within fairly uh, delimited patterns. That's what I've, that's been my experience. All right, let's go back to some audience questions. Uh, again, you can ask them through the YouTube chat function if you're watching this live. Uh, this is regarding the former immigration positions of the mm -hmm. Republican Great Party. Subject. This person asks, I recall a clip of Reagan and Bush debating during the 1980 Great primary clip. in which they both take uh, yes. stances that would shock today's totally. Republicans because they're so pro-immigrant. And Reagan, of course, uh, presided yeah. over a massive amnesty indeed. during his presidency. Oh, what accounts for the change? Yeah, so I made sure to put a lot in that in the book. And uh, yeah, it's true. It's his 1979 speech announcing his primary campaign. He called for open borders between uh, Mexico and the United States and Canada. Uh, yes, in that debate, Bush and Reagan kind of try to compete with each other to see who can be more solicitous to not only immigrants from Mexico, but undocumented immigrants from Mexico. And where that comes from in Reagan's case was uh, he just like, that was a symbol to him of how great America was, that people from all over the world wanted to come here. And he loved the idea of immigrants. And there was also um, a business element to it. He, in that seven, 1979 speech, he's describing something like NAFTA and he's describing something like Machiadoras. So, you know, this is a neoliberal argument about immigration too, as well as a humanistic one. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the transformation partly owes to... Um, uh, I haven't really studied it very closely. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd have to read more. Um, but I think it has to do with a lot to the personality of Ronald Reagan. The, he never really, um, uh, every time a, a subsequent Republican put it on the agenda, uh, the populist right just kind of roared back through media like talk radio and, and defeated it. Uh, I think it was, you know, the leadership of Ronald Reagan that allowed that to get across. And as, as I understand it, that was a pretty complicated and prolonged uh, negotiation that was fairly complex and wasn't as simple as, you know, Ronald Reagan wants immigrants to come here. Um, I think it's one of those places where I'm going to have to just kind of put a pin in it and say, I don't really have a good explanation for that, but I can say that uh, immigration is an issue in the populist right was certainly there in the 1980, in 1980, in the last page of the book, I talk about uh, some of the other election results besides Republicans taking over the Senate and, and, and Reagan winning the presidency. Uh, and one of them is uh, an initiative campaign in Dade County, Miami, in which a white woman uh, got so mad that someone started speaking Spanish to her at the mall that she put on the ballot uh, an initiative to get English declared Miami's official language and it passed overwhelmingly and they weren't even allowed to put Spanish on official government forms anymore. So it's not like it wasn't there. Uh, how that kind of uh, uh, became um, uh, an issue that became a litmus test in the Republican Party will have to be a subject for someone else to discuss. Yeah, but it wasn't invented by Pete Wilson. It wasn't invented by Rush Limbaugh. It wasn't invented by Rush Limbaugh, fair enough. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Rick Perlstein, I think we will leave it there. I want to thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us virtually from Chicago. Yes. Till next time. Today's guest has been cultural historian Rick Perlstein, whose new book is Reaganland, America's Right Turn. It is available everywhere books are sold. You can get details on upcoming virtual Commonwealth Club events at commonwealthclub.org. They're also posting some historic archives there, including the Commonwealth Club appearance of President Dwight Eisenhower. I'm Brian Edwards Teekert, and now this program of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thanks, Brian. <laughs>